am happy to be here today and I'm happy to think with you in sort of you know, these early days around social innovation at the Price School, uh, really try to give you some ideas and raise some questions. So the talk I'm gonna give is a mix of some reflection and observation and also some first insights from a project that I'm the PI for at Oxford, working with our Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship and the Skoll Foundation up in Palo Alto. And it's an effort to try to understand something about the language of systems change. And I'll say more about that as we go on. The kind of agenda I have really for us today, and I'm happy to go back and forth a little bit, though I will press on just because of the time, First is to raise some questions about this wider social innovation space. You know, the Price School, the USC has made a commitment to this area. A lot of other schools are making a commitment. It's in the news. It's on the tips of people's tongue. It shows up in places like the World Economic Forum in Davos. It also shows up in Soweto in, in South Africa. And the, the power, I think, of this idea of social innovation in part comes from its plurality and its plasticity. And I think one of the core agendas that the research of people like Christine and others here will have to do is to take that plasticity and situate it somewhere, give it some kind of empirical warrant, give it some kind of empirical focus. And, on, and so on one hand, I'm gonna really celebrate that plurality and that breadth of this idea of social innovation. I also am gonna be slightly critical and say we need research that's gonna kind of empirically discipline us and focus us. I'm gonna just talk briefly through a couple of slides, one on the context of this conversation of social innovation. I'm gonna talk there a little bit about uh, the work of Eleanor Ostrom and her work on governance of the commons. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a second. The second part then is uh, focus on varieties of research. What, what goes by the name uh, uh, social innovation? And again, the, these first you know, 20 minutes or so are meant to really open up this conversation for us give you an idiom. I am a sociologist and an organization theorist. I teach in a business school. I teach strategy and innovation and leadership, a profile not unlike Christine's and other people in the room. Uh, and that gives me a particular message. I'm not an economist. I don't think like an economist. I think there's an agenda there for economics. I think I'm not a political scientist. There's an agenda there for political scientists, for complexity theorists. But I'm going to give you one small piece of that agenda and I'm gonna argue for why we might wanna think that way. Then most of the talk will really be this work we're doing today, these days. I have a team, Paolo Savajet, who's a postdoc who just joined us from uh, University of Cambridge. He's an engineer by training, who does work in so, uh, uh, sustainability. A couple of recent MBAs who are working with us and then a network of colleagues around the world, who, some of whom are alumni, others of whom are interested in these issues, and I'll tell you a little bit about that work. That work is really in the idiom, and you'll see of language, rhetoric. What the project is about is looking at some of the global funders of systems change, the big foundations like Ashoka, Rockefeller, uh, Skoll, and others who are funding systems change. And the question we're gonna explore a little bit, and I'll give you some very preliminary findings, are when they say they're funding and supporting systems change, what is it that they're funding and supporting? That may seem like an obvious question to you. It's a not obvious question in many policy circles. And again, it goes back to the plurality of ways we use words like social innovation or systems change. They have become cultural memes, uh, in part thanks to social media, but in part thanks to a broad community <coughs> of funders. Uh, some of you may know a recent book by a guy named Anand Giridandas who wrote a book basically very critical of the move towards social innovation, of the work of the Gates Foundation, the Skoll Foundation. He's, he's a deeply critical person saying, really these elites are not changing the world, they're reinforcing the kind of nature of the elites in the world. And so, you know, th I, I think a, an important conversation around social innovation is what it does and what it doesn't do. And as I said, for me right now, and the project I'll talk to you about today, this work on the language of systems change is really an exercise in trying to say there are many uses of the word systems change. We are going to argue that there are some relatively common, regularly recurring uh, themes in that scaling up and scaling down, supporting entrepreneurs, and that those actually have very kind of material impacts, what you fund and what you support, also what happens, and importantly, you know, what doesn't happen? Where do those, each of those models run into difficulty? What are the kind of typical challenges 
that funders and ventures using that particular view of systems change run into. And then I'll <clears throat> uh, close just reflecting a little bit on the work of system builders. I have a TED talk on this if you're interested. But system builders is an idea that springs from innovation and entrepreneurship and sort of locates in not only individuals, but in collective actors, the ability to reimagine whole landscapes and to rebuild the infrastructure and capacity for those. Uh, as I said, I'm happy to enter any questions, at least briefly. If you have questions, feel free to pose them. I might collect them and respond as we go along. Um, okay, so I said the first thing I'm going to do is talk to you about sort of the context of this research, this context of the interest in social innovation. I think the world is in a complicated place today. I think you probably do also. We're at the end of a period of munificence, post-World War II boom. We're in a period of recognition of dramatic inequality, both within communities and countries. And across that, ironically, as you may know, many data systems say people in the world are historically better off than they've ever been. So even though there's intensified inequality, the broad trends are toward better uh, life outcomes for many, many people. Um, there's also a fascination with technology. I don't know if you've heard the term fourth industrial revolution. It's a catchphrase building on uh, earlier historical periods, the rise of the steam engine and the way that that reimagined the nature of work, the rise of large-scale social organization, like in factories and in uh, uh, large-scale production facilities that dramatically increased productivity but sharply truncated the autonomy of individuals. This is the world that uh, Karl Marx and Max Weber spoke about, that period in time, early, mid-19th century, <coughs> when there were dramatic increases in uh, uh, productivity and efficiency accompanied by substantial reshaping of people's identities and life chances. And, and well-being. A third industrial revolution a lot of people talk about as the coming of information intensification. Uh, and so the fourth industrial revolution then, promoted by a number of units around the world, especially the, the World Economic Forum, says something interesting. It says things like machine learning and artificial intelligence, CRISPR-R, genetic modification, uh, tr uh, 3D manufacturing. Those are all very interesting technologies, but the fourth industrial revolution, they say, is not reducible to the technology. So it's an anti-reductive argument. They say, instead, they say the fourth industrial revolution empirically is when biological, physical, and data systems start to merge. So we th think of kind of post-humanism, human enabled, uh, humans enabled by various kinds of technologies, whether a chip in the head or electromagnetic exoskeletons. But their argument is the fourth industrial revolution is in fact shaped by these plural technologies across many spaces, but their, their kind of core argument is that really the fourth industrial revolution reminds us we don't have an adequate vocabulary of governance. We don't really have institutions that are able to manage the complexity, the durability, the pervasiveness. And all of us in our lives have heard that around issues around information, privacy, the last 10 years of debates over privacy and who owns information and uh, the scraping of the internet and social media, the many scandals and debates that we all know well. So what I want to suggest to you, though, is this focus on social innovation is occurring in the context of a time when governance is really back on our agenda. This uh, person, Eleanor Ostrom, a political scientist, got the Nobel Prize about 12 years ago for basically saying something very provocative. I don't know if you've run into her work, but it's very relevant in a policy school. She said for about 100 years, economists and political scientists had divided up the terrain and said there are two kinds of governance. There are markets where we create private property and then we build institutions that allow the allocation of that private property in relatively non-physically damaging ways or, or politically damaging ways. But we imagine the market then takes care of that question of governance. And she said, on the other hand, there was an increasingly a view that said, oh, states, authoritative actors that have some kind of unique monopoly over violence come together and solve those governance problems and her critique, in a sense, was that both of those models, the market and the state, are blunt. They're insufficiently acute, insufficiently fine-grained 
to really grapple with the complexity of the human experience, the complexity of social life in these days. And she spent a lifetime, 40 years, studying uh, <coughs> uh, what some people call uh, commons problems, that is, there are fisheries, or there are timber resources, or there are fresh water, or there are grasslands. And the argument there, you may know the tragedy of the commons argument says, no one actor has an incentive not to overuse that, that common good. We're selfish, we're short-term focused. And so the tragedy of the commons is we end up overfishing or overusing or overharvesting, and then there's nothing left. And Eleanor Ostrom went around the world with her team and said, let's look at communities, and that word is important here, let's look at communities that have figured out a way to actually manage in durable, long-term ways those scarce, excuse me, those scarce resources. And so the Nobel for her was kind of a signal to say that simple duality, there's the state or there's the market, no longer adequate, no longer complete. She didn't make grand claims. She made very minor claims. Maybe these communities that are able to manage sustainably and sustainably are maybe 20% of the cases or 30% of the cases. So she didn't over-argue. She simply said there's enough cases here that we can't rely on this reductive state and market duality. And so her argument basically said, you know, the challenge here is to devise institutional arrangements that help to establish such conditions, or as we discussed below, meet the main challenges of governance in the absence of ideal conditions, human institutions, ways of organizing activities that affect the resilience of the environment and so forth. Ideal conditions for governance are increasingly rare, she said. I think this is the context for social innovation. We're interested in how to make things work, how to make things better, how to reduce inequality, how to make big public systems more efficient, how to corral and refocus private systems. So I'm gonna ask you, when you think about social innovation, in addition to all the interesting things that go on, to really think about it as a problem of governance and a search for new ways to govern, to allocate resources, to make visible opportunity, to redistribute act, uh, resource and activity. I, I'm offering this as a kind of a broad summary. It's not complete, doesn't take into account every case, but I think social innovation too easily gets mistaken as an effort to simply innovate and do something better. And that underspecifies, I think, the broader context. The world is hard to govern, it's complicated. We have these irremediable conflicts. And in some sense, Ostrom and her work and her colleagues offer us what she would call, and many people call, messy institutions. They're not neat, they're not elegant like the state or the market, instead they're messy. But that messiness enables both interests and identities to be visible and to matter over time. It's an image from one of her classic arguments about how she links the kind of context, the physical, biophysical characteristics, attributes of the community and rules and use to a series of actions and then begins to think about patterns of interaction. Her work is a critique of game theory. If you're a game theory uh, aficionado or an expert, you may not be happy with her arguments. She's someone who's skeptical about the completeness of game theory to really analyze and explain action. She focuses very much on learning and interacting individuals in a community. So one of the limits of her argument, one of the challenges for us is to imagine what would an Ostrom-like community, face-to-face, -face, interacting, what would that look like at a larger scale? How would we engage that idea to work at a larger scale? So again, not a, not a done solution, but a very different starting point than either the state or the market or the claim that that's sufficient to grapple with our world. I think the other part of the context of social innovation comes out of a long history of people most recently starting in the 70s who were interested in the environment and sustainability. Some of you may know Donella Meadows, often called Dana Meadows. Um, she was an, someone who thought creatively about systems from the 1970s on and built a large community of people who were practitioners of systems thinking and systems intervention. A famous line, well a famous line for her was dancing with systems. That the, the, the skill and art of a policy maker, the skill and art of a, a, a politician, of a practitioner, is to be able to dance with systems, to move among them, to see the linkages, to traverse that space. And her kind of famous quote was, the more I listened to people talking about environmental issues, the more I began to simmer inside. This is a huge new system people are inventing, I said to myself. 
they haven't the slightest idea how this complex structure will behave. Myself said back to me, she's a little bit humorous, right? Um, myself said back to me, it's almost certainly an example of cranking the system in the wrong direction. So she embodies, I think, this insight that system, this is an insight that comes out of organization theory, out of social psychology, out of complexity theory, you know, it's not a unique insight. Systems are emergent and more complex than we typically can describe them. What she did, though, was she said, here are 12 leverage points, places to intervene. And I think this is important because so much of the work on social innovation is about policy, about communities, about entrepreneurs who are trying to refract and move systems toward different kinds of goals and different kinds of ends. And Donna Mello did something very interesting. She said, let's start with the things that are really obvious, things like constants and parameters, subsidies, taxes, standards. And let's go from those obvious things to much harder kinds of ways to intervene. Look at number seven, the gain around driving positive feedback loops. Six, the structure of information flows. For those of you who are organization theorists or sociologists or political scientists who think about information, and even economists who think about information, a lot of these ideas really resonate. They're a, they're a list, a roster of how hard it is to know where to intervene and how to intervene. She gets down to the most difficult things. Who has the power to actually, number four, to change, evolve, or self-organize system structure? Three, what are the goals of the system? How do you talk about the goals of a system that itself is plural, multifold, and emergent? She says, finally, the mindset or paradigm out of which the system, its goals, structure, rules, delays, and parameters arises is incredibly hard. You know, as, you, as you may know from some of the scholarly work you're doing, some of the readings you're doing in class, lots of people today are talking about mindset. How do you think? How do leaders think? How do organizations think? What does that mean? What's that mindset? And finally, she says, and this is why I think system builders are so interesting, she says the most difficult thing to do is to transcend a paradigm, to be able to work across several realities. Uh, some of you may know Roger Martin, who was at Toronto for a long time. He importantly said what we need today are people who are nimble thinkers, tough thinkers, generous thinkers. Another colleague, Joe Porak, some of you know him, another colleague, Steve Rayner at Oxford said, we have to be able to grapple with contradictory certitudes, issues, ideas, principles that are on one hand completely true and we believe them to be true and on the other, they're fully contradictory one or another as individuals, as leaders, as managers, as policymakers. How do we hold those fully contradictory ideas in hand and not be paralyzed? So again, I'm giving you the Ostrom story around governance, the Meadows story around, <coughs> excuse me, points of intervention. I think those are two interesting starting points to understand social innovation, however you want to use that term. Um, I'm going to move quickly through this, varieties of research. This is a very intuitive, rough, unscientific summary of the kinds of research that is available when we talk about uh, social innovation. Some of it wants to fix the world. It wants to change unfairness or inequality. Famously, many agencies interested in social innovation want to literally fix the world from the most elite like the World Economic Forum, to grassroots organizations in Ghana, in Malaysia, or Vietnam. Another is to scale a solution. We think we have a workable finding here. We have something that works. Let's scale it. Let's make it bigger. That's a very complicated idea. If any of you are economists, if any of you have worked in strategy, you know the idea of scale on one hand is to be friction and context free. But the irony of so much of this social innovation work is it's meant to be context specific and really attend a local context. And so that idea of scaling a solution, which is incredibly powerful, central to large foundation grants in the language of policy today, there's a deep contradiction in trying to scale a solution in that sense. Another kind of research is interested in reimagining a process. Let's do this thing we do now, but let's do it differently and better. Let's bring in more people. Let's it use deliberative process. In other words, many mechanisms to do that. But let's reimagine an incumbent process. Another is to unbuild an incumbent system. This system isn't working. Let's pull it apart. Right, let's unbuild it. And then potentially, let's build a different system. If any of you follow the work of political scientists like, uh, uh, like James Scott, Weapons of the Week, Seeing Like a State, 
there's a whole set of colleagues in political science who would never talk about themselves as social innovation theorists, but who are really interested in saying, what are the implicit ideologies that are embedded in the current practices of the modern state? And how do we reimagine that? How do we unbundle that activity? Um, and how do we build different kinds of systems? I think there's a growing body of work on what I'm going to call hack existing systems. This comes from the idea of hacking, which everyone knows colloquially, computer system, computer hacking. Um, in some sense, using the logic of the system on itself, finding openings in the existing system to do something different. What I think is interesting about this um, as a research project, oh, thank you, as a research project is that most of the efforts to think about social innovation involve building new systems, unbuilding the system, reimagining the system, right? Here, news flash at 11, that's really difficult to do. <laughs> it doesn't happen a lot. And I think the, the hacking story is interesting because it says, let's not even try to change the system. Let's focus in on fixing the issue that we're trying to fix. So one of my postdocs, Paolo Savage, has a brilliant thesis he did where he said things like this. He said, we all know that lots and lots of young people, lots and lots of children die of diarrhea-based illness every year, every day. H hundreds of thousands, millions of kids die of diarrhea-born, uh, diarrhea-created uh, illnesses, we, ha we know there's a pretty simple solution to that. People call it oral rehydration therapy, ORT. A little bit of sodium, a little bit of potassium, a little bit of magnesium, a couple of cents for a daily dose, it helps the kid retain fluid and not die, a baby, not die. The problem is getting ORT to rural villages. So he did a project where he said, here's an agency that said, if you drive around in Zaire or in Tanzania, Many things are ubiquitous. One thing that's ubiquitous is Coca-Cola. <laughs> and he said, Coca-Cola seems to get everywhere somehow. And so basically, that, that agency said, let's put packets of oral rehydration therapy. Let's pack that in among the cartons of the Coke bottles that are being trucked in through whatever means to these communities. And they did that. When they got to the communities, they unloaded the ORT. They brought it to local pharmacies. And usage went from 1% up to about 40%. So that's an example of hacking the system, not trying to fix the system, not trying to change the system, literally using leverage and momentum that's in the system to go forward. OK, so that's my very kind of quick overview. Let me stop for just a minute. If there are questions, comments, am I talking too quickly? Am I talking too much in American English? Is it too boring? What's the, <laughs> no. But any comments, questions? Actually, I'm going to do this. It's an old teacher trick. I want you to take two minutes, talk to someone next to you. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. Two minutes, what are you thinking about based on what I've said so far? All right, so uh, I think both comments, thank you for both comments. I think the question about what are systems and why talk about them, really important. I think one of the places that we're coming to is that we actually may want to stop using the word system, partly because it's so kind of promiscuous and so many things. A colleague over here said, you know, the international system is broken. Who has heard in the last week someone say system X is broken, right? And so when everything is a system and everything is broken, Analytically, that may be empirically true, but empirically you're not getting anywhere. So I think that insight that so many systems are broken means three things. It means we've come to have a more critical view of whatever that process is and the outcome. It may well be that it's broken in some meaningful sense. It also, I think, asks us to begin to say, what could be different about that situation? I teach a lot of MBAs and others at Oxford. A lot of our students come from South Asia. Probably 20% of the students come from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Another 10% from China and related parts in Asia. When I talk about systems, inevitably, one of the young people from India or Pakistan will say, Mark, or they'll say Professor Entrusco or whatever. They'll say something. They'll say, Mark, um, who benefits when the system's broken? Right? These, are, these are worlds where systems are perennially broken and they never get fixed. And that's another interesting question, right? Who benefits when they're broken? And what's the nature of the benefit? And I think that's, that's the kind of question that I'm asking today to begin to reflect on, not in a mean way or an angry way, just as an analytic point. So many systems are broken today. How is that possible? Um, I, I do a lot of teaching on innovation. Some of you may know Gary Pisano at MIT. He has a wonderful paper where he says, Firms spend hundreds of millions of dollars on innovation annually and nothing happens, right? How come we keep investing and trying to do the same thing over and over and over with enormous amounts of money? Why do those systems stay broken? We need some better answer than saying they're not efficient or people don't care 
right? And I think this question around what's the nature of system is really powerful. This is the wisdom of Donnell and Meadows, right? Is getting us to have very concrete, if you want to intervene in a system, if you want to find a point of leverage, you've got to think about many features of not a single system, but many systems. Her famous line, dancing with systems, means you can't just intervene once. Systems are complex, emergent, plural. You know, that's a very different agenda than most of us have. And so I think these questions are good. And I do think that the language, oh, the system's broken, whether it's politics or food relief or humanitarian relief or whatever, when we have such broad societal conversation that the system is broken, I think we need to start to pay attention to that in, in new ways. Education is broken, welfare is broken, nonprofits are broken, venture capital is broken. You know, if everything is broken, okay, what does that mean and what do we, what do, we do about that? Others, other comments or views? No, okay, so I'm gonna go back here. So um, partly that we got into this work uh, around systems change because that seemed like such a pervasive language. As I said earlier, it's a cultural meme. Uh, there are lots of levels, lots of sectors, and again, the question is often how to change, fix, refocus, redirect in some intentional way. However, systems become a mean, loosely framed, it reflects experience, and there's a focus then beyond sort of single organization solutions. So this is where Chris, Christine and I, Paul Adler, I think all of us live in worlds where we pay attention to plural systems of organizations. You may know the large scale philanthropy, the large foundations have begun to move in that direction, not to funding individual ventures, but to funding sets of coordinated activity. So I think one of the good things here is we're thinking about systems of organizations. We're paying attention that problems and solutions both come from complex systems of organizations as well as other other kinds of actors. I think the kind of question we want to think about then is how do we understand those boundaries, interdependencies, system components, and time rhythms, tempo rhythms. I have been in many meetings, as I'm sure you have too, where people say, yep, it's a system thing. And then you say, okay, what's the next sentence after that? <laughs> right, yes, it's a system thing. Okay, what about that? And this is why I'm saying, you know, analytically we need to think about interdependencies, boundaries, temporal rhythms. Those are all very fraught complicated issues. It's not a simple question, but it reminds us we've got to get into the guts of the system, how it works, who's there, what kind of actors are there, what are the components. And this is where I think there's a lot of nice links to the work in innovation, innovation systems, the contemporary work on in innovation. You know, Rebecca Henderson a long time ago helped us to distinguish component innovation from architectural innovation. Component, when you're just putting something new in a widget that's new and improves performance. Architectural innovation, you're changing the basic relationships among the actors and the routines and the interdependencies. So I think there's a lot of borrowing we could do from the innovation world um, in that sense. And then as I said, I think this work on hacking systems that Paolo is developing is important if only to say let's not be so focused on fixing the system. Let's realize sometimes we just should ignore the system and find a solution. We need to not spend the energy involved in fixing the system. We need to go around the system or find a different pathway in. That's a micro argument, it's a micro foundations argument. I think that that's gonna become more and more popular. And again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Ostrom reminds us these are complex governance of the commons. The fourth industrial revolution colleagues remind us this may not be the technology, it may be the, the lack of an adequate vocabulary of governance. So part of my message to you today is to say, and this is why I think a policy school is such an important place, we need to really be thinking about vocabularies of governance. What do we mean by governance? What's involved? What are the available repertoires? What happens when you lose the easy distinction of market and state? And instead thinking about these third ways, complex distributed, kinds of governance arrangements. Okay, so a little bit about the project. The Skoll Center at Oxford is a 15-year-old uh, investment by the Skoll Foundation. You may know that they pioneered a view of system social entrepreneurs, like many other agencies and people. They're probably drifting away from that idea of social entrepreneurs in favor of social innovation. Um, that's probably a good thing. The word social entrepreneur is powerful, but also problematic both the entrepreneurial imagery often connotes a single individual who's somehow an amazing human being, and the social part is underanalyzed. So although I celebrate the foundation and Jeff Skoll and all their money, I, I, I want to support them in reimagining whether it's social entrepreneurs or whether some kind of organized collective action that we want to think about. 
So they're funding a couple of, prop, a couple of work packages. One is this work I'm talking about today, narratives of systems change, how to frames, models, templates, influence how people see problems, and in, then, in some sense then shape what they fund and what they do. And what our project is trying to add to that is, oh, it may also help us understand why those same initiatives run into difficulties and don't, don't actually work because they've taken on a posture and a frame and a perspective that's hard for them to go forward. Another project is very interesting. It's an effort to say the school has funded about 120 ventures over the last 15 years, very generously, a million dollars initially, five million three years later, 10 million over about five years to each of those 120, 110 ventures. And we have the opportunity to use their data and say, what do those ventures do? What, what seem to be the pathways to systems change, right, among those ventures? There's data, the, world, uh, the Schwab Foundation in Geneva has data on about 400 ventures, but here's the point for all the researchers in the room, there's very little longitudinal data on any kind of not-for-profit activity. Nonprofits, foundations, social enterprises, very little longitudinal data, very few large-scale data sets that have regular data annual every couple of years for many years. So we're excited about this because it's a rare kind of opportunity to use data that comes from within the foundation and from the ventures themselves to really start to ask those questions. Where do you get to based on where you start? Let me underscore, this is not a normative project. We're not going to say these ventures are doing the right thing. What we want to be able to say is what do they do? And do those, what they do fall into some regular or routine categories? and activities, and again, the same spirit of my first comment, how far do they get with that? So there are different starting points. Do some starting points run you into problems? Can we begin to learn to avoid those over time? Do others kind of accelerate your future? Uh, the, the challenge for both of these projects, is something everyone in the room knows is, particularly in the social innovation space, we have a very foreshortened time frame. People say things like, well, that project's been running for three years. How come hunger isn't solved? Right? You know, you had five years, we're cutting your funding, you didn't solve hunger, right? So, you know, I want to I be careful here to say, we don't think with 15 years of data we're going to find the ventures that have fixed the problem. We think we'd like to try to understand where have they gotten to. And again, as a colleague, as a researcher, I'd say to you, you know, speak up, resist that call. When someone says, oh, it's been three years, how come we haven't stopped war, right? I want you to begin to say, you know, that's an unreasonable expectation. It has taken 80 years, 120 years to build modern stock markets. It's taken 150 years to build corporations, and we know the shape they're in, right? So, I mean, I think we need to really dramatically extend the time focus that we have. And I think both these projects are kind of starting points there, but they're both dealing with such recent data that it's, we're not going to find conclusive answers, but rather hopefully open up different kinds of questions. And then lastly, we're doing some work on lessons from technology innovation. This only because so many people feel technology is the answer, particularly in these days of AI, of artificial intelligence, machine learning. You know, there's such a juggernaut saying that technology is the answer. So we're trying to understand what we know, what a lot of us know, Steve Barley, some of you know Steve Barley a long time ago said, technologies are really platforms where social action happens. Uh, and so we don't want to over estimate or over uh, reify the nature of the value of technology. And so this is a project trying to be cautious and skeptical about tech-only solutions. Okay, so what have we done? We have three basic questions. So this is the project on uh, global funders, Schwab, Rockefeller, Ashoka, Acumen, looking social media, looking at their public-facing media. How do they talk about systems change? So how do these key global and other funders define systems change? What are available conceptions of systems change? That idea of conception is important here. What's the model they have in their uh, funding protocols? What's the model they have in their media? What kind, of, what kind of conceptions of change do they valorize and celebrate? And so the first question there is, is there variation? And obviously I'm going to say to you, yes, there is variation, so that's a good thing. Um, there isn't a single conception of systems change. And like any good analyst, therein that variation becomes interesting and important for us. Then the question is, according to whom? Who gets to decide what those conceptions are? How does that process happen internally? Is it a stakeholder-based process? How do we get those conceptions of, of, of systems change? I mentioned earlier, I'd say again, one view says there's probably just one because there's a right way to do it. 
Another says there's a hundred because there are infinite variety and per, uh, perspectives and issues. And many of these agencies, as you know, are the products in the last 30 years or for Rockefeller the last 100 years of very wealthy people who made a lot of money doing whatever and then sort of built agencies and philanthropies in their own view. My colleague Alex Nichols has written a lot about the contemporary Silicon Valley, uh, um, Schwab, uh, Jeff Skoll, uh, Pierre Omidyar. He's written extensively about the kind of ideologies of each of those people who are very successful in Silicon Valley terms and the kinds of endowments they created and the kinds of, of uh, fundraise, fund giving that they've done. So a question here is, according to whom? I mentioned Anand Giranandas' book, uh, Winners Take All, uh, which is that critique of this community as being relatively naive and self-serving and not really fixing the world, but taking a lot of pleasure and feeling important in the world, but not doing that much about it. And then finally, and this is the open question, why do any of these conceptions matter? We don't have data yet on this, so I'm gonna leave you in suspense. You can have me back in a year, but, um, but I'm gonna encourage you to think about that. If there are not many, many conceptions, and if there's not only one, does that matter? If there are three or five or seven or 12, you know, what's the value of plural conceptions of systems change? Do we want that? And what's the impact on practice and everyday life? Okay, so what we've done, we started with initial sample, visible large-scale funders. I've mentioned some of them already. We're in the midst now of doing three things, looking at firms that are not only, of uh, uh, funders that are not only in the global north. We're looking at like uh, uh, AKD Aga Khan Development Network, we're looking at some of the agencies that aren't based in the global north. Some of them are not pure funders, some of them are funders and also actors, if you know BRAC in Bangladesh. So we're trying to widen the sample to capture more interesting variation. Acumen Ashoka, the Bertha Center at, UC, at University of Cape Town, funded by a large family foundation in South Africa, Echoing Green, Gates, Rockefeller, Schwarzschild, they all talk to each other. So it's not surprising that they have relatively common conceptions of systems change. So we're trying to kind of widen the sample to begin to introduce a little more variants. Um, I have some of my RAs and people are using their own language skills, Brazilian, Portuguese, uh, various uh, local Indian dialects, Mandarin, to try to actually sample things that don't make it into English. So if you reflect on it, if everything's already translated into English, again, those agencies are probably connected to this broader conversation. So we're trying to figure out, can we get something that's outside of that already linked or connected space? The design is basically three moments. What we've done so far is code public source data text from 2019, 2018. So recent data, a cross section. We're starting now to look at five or seven years ago and then 10 or 12 years ago to reflect on when this conversation around systems change consolidated. We're going back to some of the repositories of the internet that have scraped web pages and preserved them. We're also trying to interview some luminaries who've been around for a long time to try to understand, can we get some variants 2019, 2014, 2009? Again, interested in when do these conversations around systems change take off? When do they start to consolidate? When do they become similar? At this point, we're not trying to find the critics. We're just trying to say, what do these people say? What are the kind of public statements? Um, we have not, for a variety of reasons, mostly person power, we haven't started to try to do interviews. So this is a really, in a sense, it's a really low effort data collection, really using publicly available data, but it's a good, a good question. And again, the, the um, I mean, Paul's question is important. I don't think these are consensus-based views. And that's what's interesting, because we say words like social innovation or words like systems change which such, with such confidence and with such authority and with such equanimity. And so even if you begin to realize, oh, there are 10 versions of systems change wandering around or 12 versions of social innovation, it's not a bad thing, it's an interesting thing. And if, as is our hunch, those different conceptions of social innovation or in this case of systems change, if those link up to very different practices or different funding strategies or whatever, that's interesting, right? That's really gonna help us understand something about a large natural experiment that's going on where many, many ventures are all acting out of very different conceptions. 
we're coding, exploratory open text coding for shorter codes. If anyone has done things like NVivo or any of the qualitative software, we're doing that kind of first order coding and then doing reduction of codes. Uh, we're interested in the level of organization. Where is it in the organization? What's the nature of the system? That is, how do these people, and this is back to the colleague who asked about conceptions or definitions of the system, how does Ashoka understand a system? How does uh, Schwab understand the system? That's an, it's a non-trivial question because their understanding of the system, one, may be very different than the ventures they fund, and two, may be either more magisterial or more everyday. So again, we're trying to make vivid here all of the slippage in this understanding of systems change. And then the kind of emphasis on purposeful distributed change interventions. And that's what I want to share with you a little bit today. We have seen in this initial round of coding seven different conceptions of systems change. Um, not surprising to anyone. One is disrupt the status quo. You know, the world is unfair and unjust. We need to reset that equilibrium to a new level of fairness and justice. Uh, influence chains of cause and effect. So try to intervene at many points to create a cascade or momentum. Sorry, oh no. I mean, all these words are familiar. Another is empower agents. Oh, people really matter. Make entrepreneurs better. Help entrepreneurs become more effective. Right? You can begin to see each of these is not unique, and many solutions combine many of them. But why are we trying to break them out like this? To force people like you and me, researchers, people who want to go in and make the world a different place, to have that sense of discipline, to have that sense of, are these actually different things? Um, coordinate agents better. So this is the work of Rockefeller and of Gates. We need to have coordinated sector-wide connection, connections, right? This is the Harvard program, Sichi, Julie Batalanas. We need to think about cross-sector initiatives. So these all resonate with lots of good efforts, but coordinate agents better. Scale up. In other words, what we said earlier, we need to take a good idea and make it happen a thousand times. We were talking at the break. I'm particularly not enamored of the Silicon Valley mantra you may know. If it doesn't affect a billion people, it's not worth doing. So I'm a critic of that. I think that's a bad idea, right? Um, but so scale up has incredible power. It's volume. It seems like it's really going to matter. We know that scaling up, you lose a lot of the specialness and, and uniqueness of those solutions. So is that a good idea? Or do we need some other imagery there? Scaling deep is interesting. Scaling deep is something very few funders care about. It says go in a community and stay there for 20 years, right? That is not trendy. I don't want to shock anybody. <laughs> that is not trendy. But that idea of scaling deep is very interesting. And it's not on the current plate of opportunities very much. The last we saw is impact beyond the organization level. So again, thinking about collectives, coordinating activity. Um, the next set of slides here I have talk about each of these in a little more detail, just for reasons of time. I'm going to not go through each one, but I tried to give you just a quick gist of what they are in, that, in those summaries. So we found seven pretty distinct conceptions of what is systems change in what these agencies say they fund and what they value, in the kinds of ventures they celebrate, and what they treat as success. So this is a composite index. It's a data rich excuse me, a data-rich view that says we've coded across a lot of public-facing, you know, Paul's point, public-facing data put out by the agency and its, its others. And we find pretty clear, seven pretty clear views. As I said, influencing change is really about feedback loops. And again, each of these will sound like different conceptions of a system that you know as well, right? And that's intentional. We're not trying to separate this from popular conceptions of systems. So we have empowering agents uh, and on through these. Um, I want to end on this idea of systems uh, building, system builders. I'll be very brief. This is work that comes for many of us in technology strategy and innovation from a guy named Thomas Hughes who wrote a book called uh, Networks of Power. It's a brilliant, amazing book that looks at how in the 1880s to 1920s in Western Europe and the US we went from candles, uh, uh, natural gas, lighting, public buildings, whale oil, in other words, a range of ways of creating a, a light and heat, each of which had characteristic problems. Cities burnt down because they were, uh, they were lit by natural gas and it would catch fire and burn the place down. So each of them have obstacles. But um, Hughes says what's interesting about this in Western Europe and the US is that 
there emerge in each of these communities scientists, innovators, entrepreneurs, and their allies who took electricity, which in 1890 was still a contested idea among scientists. Scientists still disagreed about whether electricity existed, what it was, where it came from. In London, they were still executing horses on the, on the public stages in London, literally killing a horse by hooking it up to electric wires to show the electricity mattered. In the US, in New York, they were taking bodies from, human bodies from prisons, hooking them up, and the bodies would jerk around with the electricity. So literally, scientists were still demonstrating that electricity was a thing. Only 40 years later, and that's that time frame I mentioned to you, only 40 years later, there are large-scale working national electricity grids across most of Western Europe and in the US. And that's the, the book is a, is a kind of a, an investigation of how did that happen? And the gist, just to kind of move along, is this guy Hughes said people like Edison and Tesla, they were actually system builders. They were absolutely scientists and inventors and entrepreneurs, but those words were too little to capture what they actually did. And I've just kind of put in the jargon of business school what that work involved. They had to rethink existing value chains. They had to assemble resources and capabilities across incumbent siloed boundaries. They had to invent new solutions and means to do those. They had to broker expertise. They had to build infrastructure and capabilities. If you're a strategy person, they had to build capabilities to let those things that would harness that nascent ecosystem. And they had to unbuild and co-op legacy systems. So some of you know Andy Hargadon. He's written about this. He said, oh yeah, Edison ran electric wires through the old pipes that had carried natural gas into those public buildings, right? So they repurposed, they re rethought the existing agencies. He also gave us a nice framework of thinking about how you go from invention through a number of other stages of development to eventually get to innovation. So a key insight here, invention is not the same as innovation, and those are both a long way from any kind of impact and any kind of commercialization. Uh, Andy, again, in a talk at Santa Fe Institute, said, here's one view of Edison's library, uh, or of his, excuse me, of his laboratory, and he said, here's actually his, what his laboratory was. His laboratory was a set of distributed network ties with incumbent industries, with media people, with new kinds of capital. That's the laboratory that Edison, the system builder, not Edison the scientist, but Edison the system builder, lived in and used. Um, I'm going to end here because it's time. I think you have to go to class or lunch or something. So, so I, I have a list here of what do system builders do. What I'd like you to think about is I've asked you to reflect on the kind of expectations you have for social innovation. I've tried to celebrate the plurality of views of social innovation and how that gives us a set of challenges. I've argued pretty aggressively that the real issues there are about governance and about leverage and intervention. I've given you a taste of some work we're doing at Oxford on this idea of systems change and again the plural vocabularies of systems change. And I end here with this conversation on system builders. Um, I think that the last quote, I'll just use, you know, this is an old Gibson quote, science fiction writer, the future's already here. It's just very unevenly distributed. That is my trademark use. I steal from this guy all the time. Um, I want you to think of this. You know, if the future's already here all around us, it's not in an idiom that we recognize. It's distributed unevenly. That could mean in terms of inequity. It could also mean in terms of what we're expecting to see. The implication, though, I think of this is be a system builder. Build the world that you want to inhabit. Don't wait for it to happen. So let me end there. Thank you, Christine, for having me.